back, everyone. And we live in a world, as you know, where there are no boundaries, where imagination has no limits, and where new technologies and artificial intelligence are pushing creativity and innovation. And to reward this creativity, the Artec Foundation created the Artec Prize. And so it's time to meet this year's eight finalists. They will each have three minutes to pitch their startup, and I will interrupt them if they go over three minutes. I already apologize if I have to do that. And we're going to begin with Hello X Lab, which is an experience design con um, consultancy. And Dwayne Grek, it should be with us from Japan. Dwayne, do you hear us? There he is, Dwayne. Hi, Dwayne. Welcome to Hello. our tech. So are you ready? You have three minutes to, to pitch your startup. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be presenting you today, Immersive Space, our groundbreaking interactive immersive platform that turns everyday display systems into captivating virtual environments and even transform entire physical spaces into unique spatial experiences. At Hello X Lab, we truly believe that seamlessly blending digital experiences with the physical space will allow us to revolutionize the way people experience reality. And this creates uh, very novel opportunities in the travel to tourism, education, entertainment, healthcare, retail, and public space design. But we acknowledge that not all technology is, it works great and it can be counterproductive. Bulky VR headsets isolate audiences and they limit shared connected experiences, as well as having a low accessibility rate, which is why we went on the journey to find a better solution. And thus, Immersive Space was born. We're building a platform that delivers VR experiences without the VR headsets, because we're leveraging the power of LED design systems and projection mapping to create seamless and scalable environments. So built in Unreal Engine, Immersive Space will offer the world's largest library of fully interactive 3D virtual environments. Now these environments can be uh, customized to your preference. You can choose the time of day, weather conditions, camera angle and audio. And if you want, you can share your favorite experiences in an immersive playlist. Now, immersive can elevate every kind of personal experience, like dining. So imagine a immersive dining experience where a curated environment sequence complements the origin of your meal, a special occasion, or a seasonal menu. Now, our platform is perfect for any clients that want to push the boundaries between the physical reality and user experience. And we can seamlessly integrate into any kinds of AV systems, big and small, and we can maximize the potential of temporary and permanent installations of any scale. And we're happy to announce that we're in the development of the world's first immersive learning space with a school here in Japan. Once it's completed, students are going to be uh, able to transport into any place or any time period instantly. We can bring the museum experience into the classroom and make learning fun and engaging. This brings value to the school and peace of mind to the parents. And as you can see, the possibilities are endless. Immersive space gives you the, uh, the power and opportunity to build any kind of condition to any occasion. My name is Dwayne Gregg, and I'm inviting you to join us so together we can make our spaces immersive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dwayne. Great. And so next up is Valentin Deal from Utopia Space. It's a German platform that enables you to visit museums, galleries while sitting on your couch. And Valentin, you have three minutes. All right. Hi, I'm Valentin. We all know that the world of culture is wonderful. Uh, do I have? Uh, yeah, here, sorry. <laughs> we all know that the world of culture is wonderful, but it's more than just that. Um, Access to culture has been shown to be key in social inclusion, psychological well-being, and is even one of the human rights. And yet 12% of the European and 30% of the American population completely lack access to such offerings. 
either because of mobility or traveling limitations, or also just because they live too far away. Now, the obvious solution to this would be the digital run, but often those experiences like 360 degree tours or simple performance recordings don't do justice to the real deal, simply because they don't let users interact and immerse themselves in the experience. But now, there's a new way to make those experiences possible in the digital world. Video, please. Uh, the metaverse. <laughs> um, Imagine just popping, uh, popping up your laptop or opening or uh, putting on your VR headset and being immersed in a city consisting of all the world's museums, opera houses, stages, historic sites and more. You could explore the Louvre with your friends, afterwards have a drink at Machu Picchu and then maybe delve into a play at the National British Theatre in London, British National Theatre. <laughs> uh, move about freely and experience and interact with art like you've never done before. But as of today, most metaverse platforms aren't suitable for cultural actors mostly because they miss brand alignment, they lack visual quality, or they're just highly speculative markets that are more focused on creators than on visitors. And that's where we decided to found Utopia, the spatial experience platform that aims to make a culture accessible for everyone. We have a completely visitor centers approach, the highest visual quality on the market, are accessible from all of your devices, including VR, and already have a partner network of more than 15 internationally renowned institutions. But will users actually be interested in us, you might ask? And the answer is definitely. There are already more than 500 million monthly active Metaverse users, and 48% of which uh, claim arts and life entertainment as their main reason to join. Moreover, 71% of VR users say that they are interested in using VR to visit virtual museum tours or historical sites. If you just assume now that 50% of those interested people visit one of our institutions once a year for five euros, we create amazing revenue opportunities, not only for us, but for the whole cultural industry. And why are we the right ones to do this? Easy, because we build the bridge between culture and technology. Our CEO, Annabelle, is a former classical violinist, and I'm a seasoned developer with nearly 10 years of experience, and also a historian. Together, we already won multiple awards, including the famous Orgy at the AWE in Silicon Valley, and are backed by some amazing industry-leading VC funds and a diverse set of wonderful business angels. We just closed our pre-seed funding round and are now looking for more institution partners and clients, beta testers for our platform, and early VC contacts for an upcoming funding round, uh, seed round. Thank you so much. Thank you. Two minutes and 58 seconds. Can't do much better than that. <laughs> um, next, from Switzerland, we have Muse, which should help museums create better exhibits and to tell us how Muse will do that. Here is Mary Jacob. Behind me is an image of Ontario Science Centre. I used to take my children there all the time. It's a fun, engaging, and really inspiring experience. After spending two to three hours there on our way out, we get approached by a staff member asking us for our feedback. Now, it's a really lengthy process. We are tired. It's a long form and we struggle to recall our experience. No wonder less than 10% fill out those surveys. Now imagine you're able to give your feedback as you're going through the experience. No one is approaching you after the fact, no long forms to fill out, but you're able to do that in a very interactive way. Imagine also the museum staff are able to see your feedback in real time, learn from it, and adapt. This is exactly what Muse does. Muse is the voice of the visitor. My name is Mary Jacob. Alongside Professors Kenderdine and Kossis, we are the founders of Muse, the voice of the visitor. Muse bridges the gap between museums and their visitors. It's a digital, data-driven, platform that places the visitor at the center of evaluation. Our engineers designed a very intuitive and interactive platform deployed on iPads within the exhibition space. Museums get to choose from a variety of 28 interactive, universally recognized designs, from simple demographics, like age and gender, to asking their visitors about their qualitative experience. For example, 
I'm very comfortable, somewhat uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. I can also express my emotions, my preferred personal space, draw a picture, leave a voice memo, or take a picture of my favorite object. And all this can be displayed in real time to museum staff, and they can choose to also view it publicly. Right now, we are with partnering with 24 Swiss museums in eight different languages and deploying 237 surveys with over 25,000 voices heard. This is doubling the traditional survey's response rate and more than doubling. Thank you for listening. That's the end. I hate to have to interrupt, sorry, but the rules are the rules. Um, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Next is Ove Holmkist from Holonix Systems, created in Finland, which transforms real-world data into musical information. Ove, it's your three minutes. You... Music consumption has become static and individualized. Despite its reach, streaming often lacks context, connection and adaptability. There's a disconnect between the listener and the listening experience. Holon showcases a typical consumer experience based on the Holon platform. It's intended to be used passively using large scale movement in CDs. And the editor you see here, uh, it allows artists to map data inputs to musical output parameters. We use uh, continuous data streams uh, such as movement, environmental cues, and geographic location. And through data mapping, uh, changes in place, orientation, or speed mutate and inform musical parameters such as tempo, tonality, and timbre. And the outputs are synthesized in the Mira app, uh, either on iPad or uh, desktop map. Uh, the patch is then embedded in a whole patch that can be shared with uh, other users. These artist created structures result in synthesized music that respond meaningfully to each listener's immediate context. Combined with complex real time data, this evolving music experience changes as the listener's environment changes. And here is a map viewer of our backend. And we move beyond passive listening by bridging real-world data with sound, facilitating a deeper connection with our surroundings. While music is inherently communal, it's been siloed by technology and its evolutionary functions remain underserved in our culture. We can restore music's unifying potential by making it truly interactive and social. Places change our perception and music influences our interaction with spaces. Holoric System seeks a more intuitive and informed connection, a ubiquitous music that reflects our complex lives while responding to our and elevating everyday moments. Startup also from Switzerland, hopefully with all the videos and the slides, is also from Switzerland, and it should help you learn and understand music. And its name is Cinegram, and to tell us about it, here is Pierre Blaise Dionnet. Hi. Okay, it's going to be more simple. It's just one video. We're from France, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> We're all friends. Okay, so welcome to Cinegram. It's a place where we accelerate music through uh, a new language for music using uh, a mathematical representation of harmonies. 
and it creates a symbolic language. It's logical, it's intuitive, and easy to learn. So how does it work, the sound? We place all the notes on a circle to show the periodicity of the harmony. And when we play notes together, chords, we play shapes, and it becomes logical. So our language, 12 shapes, transform any music sheet, classical, rock, hip hop, any style, into a sequence of logical shapes. Now let's listen and see music. finally find a way to see music. This song is just one shape, even if the, uh, the chords are complicated. Just one harmonic shape. Our language is for everyone. Whether you're a beginner, it works with kids amazingly, an amateur who wants to play your favorite song, or a pro who wants to explore. We test our uh, method during beta classes at the Cinegram Lab. So you see kids, they see music very easily, they understand. So Fadel says it's very, a beta tester. It's very easy to use, it may, helps me a lot. Jana, it's much easier than the old music theory, solfege. Uh, and Matt, who is an amazing rapper, you go faster without simplifying music. Four pillars to our uh, uh, project, a unique education strategy that is progressive, and structured. Gamification and stories. We tell stories to kids. You see 12 personas that embody each harmonic shape. Their personality express, expresses the harmony and the relationship, the relationship between harmonies. We have an AI-powered education platform uh, that uses natural language processing, intelligent feedback. We need more investment in that to develop this as segment and also the four is like we develop toys and fun games to make sure like music is not a burden anymore, it's fun and it's offline, online and offline. We have a cumulative estimation of uh, 5.7 million USD in three years with a database of 20,000 users and it's a conservative estimation. Six source of revenues, online subscription, training, merchandising, retail, shows and instrument development we have activated five sources already. And we have an available demo for anyone who's interested. Well, you may be French, but you sure are on time. 3.03. <laughs> <laughs> Our sixth contestant is uh, Well of Arts from Poland, a technology to help transform art education in the school system. And to explain it to us, here is Robert Latos. Hello, thank you for the invitation. Uh, well of Art. The simplest way to explain it is imagine that you are standing in the front of the masterpieces, especially the old masters, or even, even in a child. Uh, fuck, sorry. When the child is looking in the masterpieces, it's not usual simple way to learn from it. You need the skills. I know it because I am a painter. I study at the Academy of Fine Arts. And I learned after the years how difficult is not just admire and make a photographs of the painting, but to learn something from it. Today I would like to present you our first product. We will have the premiere on Wednesday, so the timing is superb for us. We will create a software which will provide the digital transformation of art education. And the simplest way to show you the glaze is to, the glaze is the technique. The glazing technique is a technique used by old masters. And the simplify the technique is about the optical mixing. It's impossible to translate it, but to, to tell you about it, I, can, I need to show it. It was used in Europe for 400 years. Leonardo da Vinci used it, Giorgione used it, but almost nobody used it today. So this is the software, and I need the video now. OK. So. The essence is that when you use the oil paints and you have the thick oil paints, it has a structure. But when you add medium to it, it becomes transparent and change the shade. And the essence is to dry the color. 
And then when you put it on the top of it, it's changed the shade, it's become the optical mixing process. And this is thanks for our collaboration with the University of Technology in Białystok. The paints in the software behave exactly in the same way they, be, they behave like you buy the oil paints in the shop. Uh, let's create something. I create for you the sample because the software is dedicated for children, for them from 7 to 13 years old, but for, to show you the potential, I create the painting the Lorenzo di Credi Lady with the Jasmine, 15th century. It's on the exhibition right now with our museum partner, Royal Castle in Warsaw. So the painting is super complex, but when you think about the process, when you start from the sketch, so you have the drawing, you study the composition to understand it. Then you put the layers of color. Now the semi-transparent, opaque, yellow, blue. And with the 35 steps, I reach the quite close results of the painting. So that allows museums to, in, to, to show the painting in steps, in animations, and give the children the tablets to try, of course, the simplest tasks. So we know that only the tool is not enough for education, so we prepare educational lessons and tutorials. Lessons are based on the masterpieces related to the museum partners, and tutorials are help to understand step-by-step -step processes regarding to the, to the software. So now we are basically ready. We're just finishing the, the processes. We will launch on Wednesday, and thank you very much. Thank you. Next is um, sign, in sign era, who's also from Switzerland, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, um, a startup which focuses on creating solutions for people who have hearing impairments. And to present this startup here is Ahmed Sherwood. So the story started maybe before seven years when my cousin, he's deaf. And he fell in, with lo with lo in love with someone, but she's not deaf. So we went together in the cinema, and in that time, I realized that the cinema don't offer any uh, helpful uh, uh, tools for such a community. So um, there is no cinema offering sign language. So uh, the experience of me is totally different than him. And I realized that in that time, there is one billion live with a problem or disability, half of them they have been related with, sign, with uh, hearing. So what's really the deaf community have? For the mobile phone, they don't have any assistive stuff. For the streaming online service like Netflix or YouTube, they just having subtitles. But most of them, they cannot follow any subtitles. Why? I can speak that later. So the TV channels, they know this problem, so they offer just one hour of sign language. But it costs so much. Why? Because simply, if we hire the gentleman, he come with the team, the team doing everyone's job, but it costs so much. But for that model, we creating avatars based on machine learning, he can cover YouTube and all the TV channels of the world. And that model, it will be commercial 24 hours and for many multi-language of sign language. So here is how it will work. For example, here, the normal TV just to offer subtitles. But here, it will have like sign language like any other sign language or any other uh, languages. So we will have like English for America, English for Britain, German for Germany, or sign language for Germany, sign language for Switzerland. I'm not sure. So this is really what we're looking for, that one day we will embed our sign language in all the portals, like Netflix or YouTube. There are many other competitors, but we can beat them if we really offer enterprise solution. So the TV channels can replace the avatar 24 hours instead of a human being. Um, this is very addressable market, and we can reach that because there is no alternative for, for something like that. And we already working in a three uh, models, like a freemium, so the TV channels can um, subscribe, or this community can download the avatar and just getting access to sign language. 
we have some attraction and we're working with the University of Geneva and the EDIAB Institute in Belay. And we're already building the French sign language and after that we're gonna building the German sign language. And we really, I mean, my startup, it's really um, like needs meeting the art and technology. Because for example, this, this is the avatar. So we can replacing some stars or some important person or public figures like as an avatar. And at the same time, that's, okay. so, but anyway, I reach it to the finish and uh, I'm looking to be like a, a, a smile for everyone deaf. Thank you. Boy, do I hate interrupting people. It's very complicated. And our last contestant is Skiru Projects from France, a startup which will develop its first, the first digital memories for culture and tourism. And to tell us all about it, here is Hélène Quintin. Hello. The first attack forum took place in 2017. And imagine having received six years ago a unique digital souvenir in the form of an NFTs. So you will be the unique owner and no one can dispute it. And this year, you may, why not, have the chance to win a special offer from one of the Heaven partner? Why not also in partnership with uh, Villar um, uh, to win a special experience? So that's what we are building with Kiru. We are developing a digital platform to create links, links between cultural institution, even organizer, people, and also with brand. So how does it work? So first, our partner has to create its digital souvenir. So we have different possibilities. So it can be a more simple souvenir in 3D with an augmented reality experience. We can also create um, AI with generative heart souvenir, and we can also do partnership with brand and artist. But it's not all. You can add advantages to the souvenir to create links with your audience. The digital souvenir can also be an asset from an, ed an, an educational games. And for instance, imagine you are a, a kid, you have to visit, you have to go on the place, learn something to get your digital souvenir to progress in the game. We really wanted to make links between virtuality and uh, reality. For the visitors, it's really simple. He only has to scan a QR code at the end of his visit, and we automatically created a blockchain wallet associated to animal. So it's really simple, and anyone can get his souvenir without any technical knowledge. Keru is also to be a new source of funding for our partners. At each purchase of a souvenir, we give back a percent of the amount to our partners. Today, we have one year, and we already partner with prestigious institutions such as Chateau de Chantilly, Guérande, um, with Brun, with Le Petit Prince, to make a digital collection of all the places linked to Antoine de saint exupéry around the world. And in two weeks, we're going to launch the first digital souvenir of one of the biggest French institutions. I only can say um, a hint, it's next to the Seine River. And we are a team of seven people based in Station F, Paris. And I co found Kérou with Sébastien from EPFL. Um, our mission, vision is global, and we will have the mission to, to make people actors, not only spectators, when we visit cultural institutions, and to be a link between virtuality and reality. And I offer you now, I propose you to, to try our platform by getting your digital souvenir of the Artec Forum. 2023. Thank you. And this souvenir is meeting on the Tesla blockchain. I'm on time. <laughs> French on time. So. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you and have the honor of announcing who the winner is. If you were on the platform, maybe the surprise will not be as big as expected, but let me um, uh, give you a little bit of a context about this, uh, uh, this process. So there were, uh, we formed a jury of nine people, four, four of which uh, I believe are present here, Caroline Ganarel, Claudia Schachenmann, Fabrice Delay, and Christian Sim, together with Paul, Alerza, Alezra, Laurence, Lenny, Jean-François Ricci, Olivier Audemars, and Patrick Ebicher. So all nine of them uh, selected out of the 30 dossiers that we received as contestants for this prize, uh, the eight that we had the pleasure of seeing today. Uh, 
And uh, so they were asked, as you have noticed probably by now, to prepare a pitch of three minutes. And uh, the idea is that the audience decides who is winning. So I have the great, great pleasure of announcing that Cinegram from France has been the winner. Congratulations. Welcome on stage uh, for a well-deserved applause. Um, you will be the happy recipient of uh, three prizes. I mean, it's a prize consisting of three gifts, uh, one, uh, two of which um, will be provided by 110 Industries uh, and consisting of a game that I hope you will have a lot of fun working uh, or playing with, as well as coaching by the CEO of 110 Industries himself, Anton. In addition to a check of 10,000 K, uh, 10,000 francs, sorry, <laughs> that's a bit much, uh, in order to help you get started and have many people enjoy your wonderful startup. Congratulations. Thank you. Phone to work. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, just to let you know, it's a life commitment. It's more than 12 years of research. Uh, 12 years ago, when I was telling to people that I had synesthesia, that I was seeing uh, things when I was playing music, I was uh, considered as a crazy man. But now that we have developed the technology, then it's part of reality. <laughs> and thank you for mathematics with art. Thank you very much for your attention and your votes, and congratulations. Congratulations, and thank you for your votes and for your participation. Um, we will now, uh, we were very lucky last night, actually, I should start with that. We were very lucky last night to see this incredible performance by the Gilles Jobin troupe, and today he will moderate for us the next round table. Um, we have politic poetically, sorry, called Dancing in the Stream. As you saw last night, the digital revolution on movement and live art is here. It is here to stay. So what does it mean for live performers? What does it mean for the artists? Our next round table will address this question. So Gilles Jobin will let you introduce uh, your panelists. Okay, hello. Good, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy to, to introduce uh, our guests. And um, maybe because it's one of the first, I've been in many of those panels since I think it's the first time that on stage we have really the makers and the performers. We talk about startup, you know, CEOs and directors, but uh, not so often about the people who make um, um, this live uh, on stage. So I'm, I'm going to present you by the distance of travel to Villar. So I'm going to start with you, Philip, because you come from Los Angeles. Uh, so you're an action dancer, action actor, and a stunt, stunt artist. Um, and I think, you know, maybe you killed Philip probably a thousand times if you play uh, Avengers or Spider-Man. You work uh, for video games and, uh, and uh, movies. So you're going to talk about your craft, the specificity of motion capture uh, for the gaming industry. Uh, Susanna, she comes from Geneva, originally from Barcelona. She's a long-time collaborator of our company. You saw her yesterday on the screen. She was dancing cosmogony. You saw her as an avatar. Uh, so Susanna, she has lived the transition from the work at our company, the stage work as a contemporary dancer with a career as a contemporary dancer, uh, to the transformation into uh, from stage pieces to digital pieces. So she will tell us about her experiences in the exploration of the new digital territories for choreography. And uh, the one that had less to travel, actually, Zilia, even though she's now at the moment in California at uh, CalArts, and uh, she's from Hong Kong, but she's, she's going to be calling from California if we get the connection. Um, she just started this week two masters in CalArts in Los Angeles. And um, you might have seen her on social network because she's like everywhere. Uh, she's starting her, key, her career as a creator, but for, for her, uh, it's really, she has all the digital um, equipment for motion capture that's available to us. Uh, we represent, I think, three different generations, but for her, she's starting her career as a creator with the, those tools. Hi, Zilia, how are you? I'm very good. And, yes. um, and you're nice the, to it's, it's the middle of the night, right? Yes. 2.45. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> okay. Very so be, before before I give the voice to the to the to to, to, to our uh, performers, just like a few words on motion capture. Motion, motion capture is the is the technology that allows us to capture mo movement digitally and to integrate it in a 3D space. Um, it's not the mocap technology that is so new. It's been a, around for a while, uh, but it's the capacity of the processor to render the movement in 3D in real time. So the piece you saw yesterday, I don't think that five or six years ago would have be will be avail avail uh, possible to do, just because the the processor was not fast enough to calculate in real time the rendering that you saw yesterday. So uh, you know there's different systems for motion capture. Um, we're not going to go through all of them, but the main one, uh, you know, there's like point, point cloud motion capture, which is uh, uh, like a Kinect, for, in, for, for instance. You have inertial mocap, which is with accelerometers, which is the Rococo suit, perception neuron, X sense. But they, they have a certain amount of difficulty, which is sliding in the, in the space. You have the optical mocap, which is the highest, I think, level at the moment with companies uh, such as uh, Qualysis from Sweden or American Vicon OptiTrack. Um, and this is, to me, the most precise uh, way to capture uh, motion uh, in space, very precise, also the most expensive equipment. And, um, and then you have the videometry, uh, but that's, that's even more expensive. And this is about, it's like a, a bunch of uh, uh, video cameras that capture the movement uh, um, as a video and recreate a 3D uh, a 3D avatar, but that creates megatons of data. I don't think it works really for now, uh, for real time. It's just like mostly unaffordable. And there's some new tech that are coming up with phone, trigonometry with phones, or even one single phone. But for now, to me, they're not uh, totally yet ready. But obviously, motion capture will be uh, in the year to come uh, easier um, to do. So maybe uh, let's, let's start with you, Susanna. Um, so we're going to present a video. Uh, let, let's start with Susanna's video, please. Okay, so Susanna, you, you had a career on stage and a career in the di digital uh, world. How did you embody this uh, digital transition? Well, well, as you see, we're having a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, I lived my transition not really as a transition, was very much like moving forward with my practice into uh, beyond what I was doing already before, which was uh, using my body to express and to embody some imaginary uh, state or idea from the choreographer or environment. Now, the, what the difference is, is I can, I can visualize what I'm embodying and it gets very concrete. So I can really go really uh, um, augmenting my experience 
and the experience of the representation of the body, like as a performer, and trying to pass all the emotions. And as we don't work with voice like um, and words, everything has to go through the body and has to go through the layers of technology. So what I like about this is like I can really explore all the subtleties that um, I can bring to this uh, digital um, language. So, voilà. Thank you. So let, let, let's, let's move on to Zilia's video now. Beautiful Zelia, thank you. Um, so my question is like how a competitive ballroom dancer from China becomes a next level technology digital dancer, creator? Yeah. Um, I think the journey begins with the curiosity and also um, as diversity as my core um, exploration, how to be present. Because, um, for example, dancing with a partner can be a real person, but sometimes also can be a virtual bodies. So I start to um, explore like a multidisciplinary research and also coming from um, um, village or a university related to technology to like uh, moving to Hong Kong and create more um, collaboration between different uh, um, general. That's very exciting. And also I born two years before zero of the new millennium. I have been a native of the digital world. So it's been a real world for me to do some complex and expanding experience constantly. So I think that's a starting point. All right. So now let's move on to you, Philip. So let's show the video.
Thank you so much. So, similar question. Tell me how a hip hop dancer from Texas, hooked on martial art, uh, featured on American Got Talent, uh, to become became an action actor and a stunt artist uh, in mocap in Hollywood. Thank you, Jill. Um, let's see. For me, the beginning was uh, actually after coming out of university. I was asked to create music um, by dancing with another dancer. Um, in 2012, uh, we had wires hooked to our body and taught the University of Texas Symphony to play the same music we were playing as we were dancing. Um, so before I moved to Los Angeles, I had this idea in my head that um, technology could augment my performance and that I could collaborate in many different ways. I've always been a nerd. Um, and that led me to find a solution for a problem that all dancers have. And especially in America, a dancer is not allowed to own their own work. Um, one of the most prolific choreographers of all time, Martha Graham, uh, she has never owned all, any of her own work. And she took that to the Supreme Court at, in the Americas three times and was turned down. So after I discovered that by using technology, I can create a product, then I thought, oh my gosh, there is finally a way for me to keep what I create. And um, in America, that had never been a possibility before. So I just continued to explore AI, metaverse, VR, motion capture, and eventually all those skills get used somewhere. <laughs> Okay, so um, I think what will be interesting now is to open up the discussion between you three and, and that you can tell us a little bit, maybe some anecdotes or some specificities or differences or, or you know, what is your interest and in, in, in what you see uh, in this. I think there's, there's the relation between these three because uh, Philip is now resident at our studio in Geneva. We have the same studio that we perform Cosmogony. So he's also discovering the way we work. Suzanne obviously works with us uh, for so many years and Zilia was at the studio last year. So I think that's, that's also how we are connected. And that's what we do is to try to open up and give access to motion capture, which is a very expensive hardware. And I believe that if we can uh, give access to the hardware, then uh, that's when uh, uh, this uh, it will grow. And just before I, I give you the word, I think uh, maybe it's important to realize that movement is leaving its digital revolution at this very moment from maybe in 2020, 2023. If you think about it, in 1980, it was for sound sampling digital uh, files, the distribution of sound and music uh, totally changed. Then we had Photoshop in the 90s, the, you know, Photoshopping uh, an image, changing an image. Uh, and then we, it was the digital video, digital cinema, that's also totally changed the creation and the distribution um, of, of, the, of this media. Uh, but for movement, uh, even though motion capture is quite recent, uh, I mean, quite old. Uh, it's only recently that uh, we can process in real time uh, this amount of data. So for us, it's a new possibility to augment uh, our movement, to uh, play with scales, to multiply our movement, to access to incredible scenarios. Um, and uh, I have seen the transition, and I thought it was nice to Zelia to mention that uh, sh being born you know, recently, she uh, it was born already inside the, this transformation. So I'd like to open up the discussion with you guys, um, and, and I really want to hear about your, your experiences and, and what, what you got to say. That's your time. Um, I guess I will start by saying that Something that is surprises me is like, for instance, now we are reunited here with Philip, uh, Zilia and me that come totally from different backgrounds and we have different ages and, and uh, different practices and different um, uh, directions, maybe, probably even. But once we get in the mock-up studio, it's like, we speak the same language, we have the same um, uh, worries, and we use the, the, the body in the same way. It's, it's really, really nice to share the digital world. It's like the, the place where we unite us, the three of us. That is really funny and surprising. 
I can uh, definitely add on top of that. I agree 100% with what she says. And um, to see additionally that uh, there is a place where motion capture is being used by dancers for dance uh, was completely new to me. Uh, even though I did go to university for dance and studying the brain, uh, I had only seen motion capture used in a commercial entity. I began studying it uh, for eye tracking software and then uh, moved to Los Angeles where it is primarily only used for video games. Uh, so when I saw <laughs> Cosmogony for the first time, seeing them in the studio and how they were using it, for me that was uh, rather mind blowing. Like really and truly the, the, uh, the difference in how something can be used, the exact same technology uh, is, is beautifully different on opposite sides of the world, all three sides of the world, um, <laughs> and for different purposes. Uh, the, the things that you two do, I have honestly never had the opportunity to do, even though uh, I build motion capture facilities and virtual production facilities in LA. Um, and yeah, that is amazing to see. Uh, Zelia, sorry, I don't want you to feel left out because I can't hand you the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Virtually grab it, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I guess um, it's very interesting. Like uh, we met online through movement and also through social media. Sometimes, for example, Jill's connect with me while I'm doing a mocap practice and the post on Instagram, and then we continue to do some remote performances during corona so we found ways to being together and uh, not only physically but also mentally you know to engage with our body requires so much understanding on the also to question things to allow different ideas emerge. So I think with the AI capability processing so rapidly and also the real-time power, I think in the future, we're also learning not only mocap as a tool, but also the related field. And uh, we are preparing for the future dance. That's wonderful. Like uh, we're not only prepare, but create it together. Maybe also with audience to immerse them together or to have different perspective. And I remember so um, Jill's VR one, like uh, it's incredible to see what's on stage and what's behind the stage. So it creates the connection between physical and the digital so sim spontaneously. All right. Um you give me a good transition to my next question. Um, I mean, there's a, something else that you sh th all of you three share that is invisible, is the, the work that you do in technology. So, uh, Philip, you are also a motion capture technician. You work uh, with the quality system. Uh, Susanna, during uh, COVID, you've been learning uh, Unity and uh, a bit of Blender, and uh, you are now able to integrate a motion capture into a 3D scene. And uh, Zilia, obviously, you're a DIY woman, and you're doing a lot of uh, tech stuff yourself. So maybe I'd like you to, to tell us a little bit your approach to technology. Um, and, and before that, uh, my, what I saw uh, as a choreographer and as a director is... Uh, how dancers are 3D uh, specialists. And it's kind of obvious that dancers uh, can learn uh, easily to work in Unity or any 3D software really, uh, because they know about movement, they know about space. And uh, for us, you know, when uh, Susanna started to uh, um, work on Unity, uh, that means that she can record the scene and integrate in Unity and for me as a director is a great asset because the technician maybe with the you know different takes they might not choose the most interesting one in terms of the quality of movement so what I think what we all three are looking in what we do is the quality of movement um, so tell me a little bit the relation that you have with the technology and how important it is for you uh, to put your hand into the tech Sure. Um, my gateway into um, professional motion capture in Los Angeles was selling inertial suits to Disney Imagineers by finding them on the internet 
finding their address, going to knock on their door, and showing them that I was wearing a motion capture suit and trying to sell it to them so that I could cut down the amount of animation time that they were doing. Uh, most of them hated me. <laughs> they were like, you're taking my job. Um, but it, it, it showed me, honestly, uh, where my entry point was. And um, I think it allowed me really to, to see what the landscape was like. Um, your question mainly, you know, what is my perspective of technology? And I think it is like wearing stilts. Um, it allows you to stand a little bit higher. And when you stand a little bit higher, you can see a little bit farther. When you see a little bit farther, you can make a little bit better of a decision. Because you've made a better decision, you now have better options available to you. And those things can get you closer to your goals, allow you to collaborate quicker and faster. Um, we met at one of the venues that I used to run, and um, had I not had that opportunity to make the transition from dancer, choreographer, stunt person to producer and paid technologist, even though I had been experimenting on my own for quite some time, um, I never would have had many of the professional opportunities and um, would not have been able to develop a career as a technologist. Um, many times as a dancer when I walk into technology spaces, whether it's in San Francisco or Los Angeles or New York. Um, I'm sure if I continue to do so in Europe, oftentimes I walk in and someone goes, yes, this is Philip, he's a dancer. And people go, mm. <laughs> And that's done. And then someone asks, what do you do? Oh, I use infrared calibration technologies to build $6.5 million virtual production facilities. Now they are interested. Um, so for me, technology, you know, it, it allows us to do more and be seen, I think, by many institutions, uh, whereas in the past we were overlooked. And um, even so, in the institutions, they need the right performer to do the right movement in a video game or a movie. Uh, it is still what Gilles mentions. It's this quality of movement that cannot be replaced. And um, yeah, I think the, the flow is that you just continue to go. Um, and you get bolstered by technology, you get supported by it if you use it. Yeah, exactly. I agree with everything. <laughs> yeah, for me it was like quite quickly I wanted to put my hands on it. I don't know, like you record your dancing and you create some uh, scenarios and then it's like you give it away and <laughs> I don't know how to say. <laughs> and. Uh, kind of you understand the dynamic and the strength and the, 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 the tension between the two bodies in 3D. I don't know, the, it can change every meaning if you put two bodies like really close to each other or you just a little distance. I don't know, the tension that you create with the distance of the two bodies and the movement, it is very um, important. So I think uh, for me it was very naturally, I really w wanna jump on it and Secondly, I think it was really helpful for me to uh, open communication with the te technical part, like understand what they do, how they do it, how long it takes for them to do what we ask them to do. Uh, and for them also, they understand us better, you know, what we need, what we, why we warm up, for instance. Like uh, we at some point, uh, we were doing warm up together. I don't know, I think uh, the, the, the communication between the, the performance and the art, uh, the technic technological people, technical guys, was much more strong and uh, we could grow together into a much uh, uh, strong uh, artistic um, direction. Mm. Celia? Yes. Um, for me, I think um, to experiment is part of my practice. So I, I love to collaborate and uh, using technology or motion capture, I met friends maybe doing robotic design or fashion design. And then we form a team to learn something new together or to also reimagine and recreate a dancing body in this new technological empowered visual context. Um, so this one is like a discover what's DNA that we can wave things interwave together. So I do learning some like um, uh, editing 
video tools before. So I think from 2D to 3D and then can control the perspective or to open more perspective to experience that gives me so much pleasure to doing something out of mainstream because take the less traveled path is always my um, goal <laughs> and it excited me. Thank you. Um, yes, I think um, that that takes me to the, this question of, uh, you know, the new jobs of the performing arts. We need, uh, I mean, as a performing artist and, and dealing with technologists and digital artists, uh, we need to create a new uh, uh, communication, a new flow of communication, find the right wording that some words might not mean the same. And also this is the culture of culture or the culture of the performing art versus the culture of video gaming, for instance. So there's, there's also a learning curve, I think, in the collaboration. And uh, what, I, what, what I hear in what you say is that you want to be in control, you want to, you want to control your environment and you want to control the dialogue and you want to lead uh, in, this, uh, in those new digital territories that you are, in a way, you are the explorers, you know. I very often compare the immersive space uh, like uh, scuba diving, you know, scuba diving basic it was you know made, became available in the 70s and, uh, you, and you know anyone could buy a uh, scuba dive equipment take some classes and access to a totally different reality that was there all the time but it's only accessible today and that's how i feel about the immersive uh, uh, spaces um, so yes thank you th thank you for getting into this because it's you know as a creator and I, I think I have a similar approach uh, in my work and even when I was a young creator I would learn about you know stage technique I was a stage technician so I know about lightning I know about sound and I felt that it was essential for me to control my environment as a creator uh, all the different aspects I'm not a specialist uh, but I'm, I know enough to, to direct um, so now maybe uh, to, to, to finish up, because we have about uh, uh, nine minutes, so did, I, I'd like you to, to maybe tell us some, some anecdotes, some, something that you think that is relevant to the discussion that you think is interesting, uh, that, that, that could express somehow your reality as a performer. And I, you, I know you have many, Philip. You just, you just need to choose carefully. Uh, the reality, my personal reality uh, with motion capture is I am both a technician, I apply the markers, the very reflective material that the infrared bounces off of to the correct places to the body, I prepare the infrared system, I calibrate it, um, I'm the person running the computer during the shoot, uh, I clean all the data afterwards, and I'm usually collaborating with the client to make sure that the data is correct, that it fits their timeline, their storyboard, their script, uh, whether it's a film, video game, commercial, uh, what have you. And um, oftentimes I am also the performer, uh, working very often with Sony or Marvel uh, to do uh, various, mostly games. And I think one of the in most interesting things about um, the audition process, how video games are created uh, in the shoot, you have either navigations or cinematics. Navigations are your basic move sets, uh, a punch, a stand, a breath, a look, running your hand through your hair, maybe checking your sword. Those are all navigations. Uh, a cinematic is the thing that you watch um, after you've played the game and beaten the boss and you're like, oh, that was such a cool little short film. Um, the thing is, when they want to record those, they do not tell you ahead of time what is going to be recorded. Uh, when I did Spider-Man, I was on set already performing for three hours before I knew I was doing Spider-Man. Um, someone in the back just happened to say, yeah, but Miles Morales. And I went... Um, <laughs> what that ultimately means is that if you are not one of the highest trained people for exactly what they are asking for that day, um, you will have no time to prepare for it. When an actor uh, gets an audition, they get the script two or three days ahead of time and they begin to prepare. Uh, I am called in and I am standing in the suit and then someone says, okay, I need you to run, jump over this box, do a backflip over that thing, catch the gun, check the gun, make sure you know what gun it is, fire it, reload it, the giant smoke monster is gonna come through the thing, I need you to defeat him with kung fu, then go over here, grab this bow and arrow, shoot that thing, the box is gonna drop, I need you to defeat this guy with Wing Chun, then I need you to come over here and Krav Maga because this is a Western film. <laughs> in 
And if you don't have the, if you are not trained to the quality of movement that they need in that moment, then uh, ultimately the work, the art does not get created or they call someone else and you do not get called back. <laughs> that is my reality. <laughs> I cannot beat that, sorry. I think I'm going to pass on that. <laughs> Come on, Susanna, you have some anecdotes. <laughs> what about you, Zelia? Any anecdote you want to share or like maybe your reality or, you know, what did yes. you... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so last year I created a full links piece is immersive and uh, actually i'm not a performer but i do experience with my dancers so three of them share one suit so means 70 senses will be divided to three bodies so they connect and then become one so how to make them understand the uh, transformation from one body to two body to three body and then combine together that process also um to the, like a, we did a lot of experiment how to make it more make sense with the narrative. So there's no like a previous experience can explain or to follow. So that's require a lot of engagement with like imagination. So I have only one body part, but how it related to the ensemble or how to well in in. Interact with other dancers while having the sensation awareness of the self representation with the visual representation. So there's the multi layers how to um, quickly interpret, but also to see the feedback in real time to create a, a communication. That's interesting me. And uh, for now, I'm also doing some um, video design about like a for live performances. So I think performing is a way to navigate through different dimension. That's like a very hard, very sensitive, and uh, also trying to perform different layers to create the um, um, surprises or like the clues that the people can imagine by their own rather than to tell. Okay, thank you. Yes, may, maybe I can share something uh, that you, you kind of trigger this, this, this um, uh, Philip, is, is about formation. So uh, I don't know if Corinne is in the room, but she's, oh, there she is. Uh, Corinne, she's, she's one of maybe the only action actor uh, here in Switzerland, uh, working not only in Switzerland, but in different places as well. And uh, she's also now starting to teach in different uh, high schools. Uh, I mean, um, um, art schools uh, about uh, motion capture and uh, when we were in Los Angeles with Susanna in, uh, in November, I mean January this year, um, we, we met Philip and he, he told us, oh you know there is some mocap classes in Los Angeles, I mean you can go and check it out and uh, they do it every Saturday in the park and I was like, yeah, in the park with a mocap system and said no, no, they don't need, there's no mocap system, they just learning how to, how to uh, move, how to act in, in motion capture so he hooked us up with a um, um, TJ Storm, which is, a, yeah, we can say like, yeah, a maestro, and he did Godzilla, and he did uh, Iron Man, and so, you know, you probably saw and seen him in many video games, and he's a big, uh, Im Im impressive uh, guy, and uh, very gentle, and, 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 and very inspiring, and uh, we were with Suzanne, and went to see this class, which I think in all the classes they give, they give like beast, uh, or beasts, or, you know, fighting scenes, and a lot of different classes, and that was about video transition, which is the less spectacular of all the classes, because video transition is like the little transition seen that does the non non uh, playable characters no it's just like when you know you can hanging around before someone comes to talk to you for instance so we were Suzanne who was like with our mouth open for two hours that we watched the class because we thought oh man this is so great I mean they embody so well the you know and how they the, the instruction in was giving and it was so precise and so industrial in a way because it's, they need to be like, it's very codified in the gaming industry, it's not like us where we can, you know, move, you know we, we go by the, our inspiration, but then they really have some really concrete stuff to do. So it really triggers something in, in my mind about, you know, formation. So that's also now why we are engaging in this. And also we, we're going to teach a workshop with Corinne and Philip and Susanna uh, this weekend uh, uh, for Focal, which is uh, the, 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 
the organization for cinema in Switzerland, and uh, and and we have some. There is some schools that are starting to reach out uh, to include this in their curriculum. So we, we really think is is a growing uh, field. It's a it's a beautiful field uh, and a beautiful artists. Um, so um, I think we, we we're going to wrap it up. I, I'd like to thank you all for for coming, and uh, you know, it's, I'm I'm happy to be in an art tech conference with uh, an uh, only artist panel. Thank you so much. Thank, 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 thanks for the art. Thanks for the tech. Thank you. Actually, without the artists, our tech wouldn't exist. So you are really at the center of it all. Thank you so very much. We will now um, have lunch break, and um, one of the contestants of the Art Tech Prize Muse is doing a little survey during lunch, so you'll find some papers on your table, so please take the time to fill it out, which would be very nice. And when we come back, we will be talking to our special guest, Jean-Michel Jarre, via the internet, because unfortunately he could not be here with us. So we'll see you back here in about an hour. Thank you. Thank you.